Five Nights at Freddy's, everyone's favorite game franchise about creepy Chuck E. Cheese mascot knockoffs that come to life and try to kill you with very dubious motivations. That's, I mean, come on, that's gotta be true, right? Even if you don't like them, what's even gonna compete with that? Despite the fact that this franchise has churned out about a million games, books, short stories, crossword puzzles, and scavenger hunts hidden within the HTML codes of websites, none of those are a joke by the way, when it comes to Freddy's, there's one thing that's always been tricky to figure out. The plot. And by tricky, I mean when you Google Five Nights at Freddy's Theory, seven million results come up. Now, I must admit, I'm not a FNAF aficionado myself. I'm just not much of a horror game guy. So whenever I hear people talk about this franchise, I just hear animatronics, purple guy, Michael Afton, Fazgoo, Springlock, fa ooh, Springlock failure. For those of you who don't know, I have a master's degree in mechanical engineering. So, you know, deep lore about ghosts possessing robots and complicated family drama, I'm all right. But references to very obscure spring-based mechanisms, oh, oh, say less. From what I've gathered from the hundreds of FNAF theory videos that YouTube keeps recommending to me, a big goal of the theorist community right now is to piece together a definitive timeline. And the comings and goings of certain animatronic models can be a big clue to figure out what happened when. The ones that I'm the most interested in is a specific type of animatronic called the Springlock Suits, which in the lore were made for the first Freddy's location. But after a fatal accident involving a Springlock failure at one of the restaurants, the suits were retired. So anytime we see a game or cutscene or something with one of these suits up and operational, we know that it happens early in the timeline. Trouble is, we've been shown a couple of events that seem to depict a springlock failure, and we don't know which one is the one that caused the suits to be officially decommissioned, so we don't know where to place our benchmark. But there is one thing that we know for sure. If the games are to be believed, these springlocks and the suits that they power are incredibly dangerous. So I did what any logical person would do. I bought one. Richard, hit that intro. Richard? R Richard, the intro. Richard, hey, hey, are you playing Marvel Snap on the Java? So first, to answer the obvious question that I bet you're all asking, yes, a spring lock is a real thing. They're not super common and they're pretty hard to find. When you Google them, a bunch of stuff about Five Nights at Freddy's just comes up. But yes, this is a real spring lock. Now, I hear you. What sort of government restricted military source or dark web black market did I have to go to to get my hands on such a dangerous piece of equipment? Well, I hesitate to even tell the masses, lest this dangerous piece of machinery get into the wrong hands, but I suppose it's only right. I got it for like eight bucks on Amazon, and it they just sent it to me in the mail. Because honestly, despite what the games might lead you to believe, this really, I mean, really isn't all that dangerous at all. I mean, I guess it's like, it's pretty heavy. Maybe you could like do some damage if you chucked it at someone or something. But I mean, in reality, it's no more dangerous than like a paperweight or something. So putting all the game's confusing lore about serial killers and possessed robots to one side, what is a spring lock and what does it do? Well, put simply, it's exactly what the name says. A spring, as I'm sure you're all aware, is this little coiled part right here. Springs are useful because when you compress them or stretch them and then let go, they return back to their original position. A spring lock basically holds the spring in place. In this one that I have here, you just pull the spring back, twist it so these pins go into the frame, and there you go, spring locked. To release it, you just you pull it back, you do the opposite, and it's back to just being a spring. This is a very industrial one used in, well actually I have no idea, but it's the strongest one I could find and even it is really not dangerous. But a much more common example of a spring lock mechanism is this, a pen. 
apparently when I wrote this script, I forgot that I was a Gen Z kid who lives on his own. So uh, I don't actually own a, a real pen. Richard, if you could just, just animate one in here real quick for me, that would be... That'd be great. It works a bit differently from the big industrial one, but there's a spring in here that holds the tip back in the body of the pen. Clicking the pen pushes the tip out and locks the spring in place so it doesn't fall back in. Click it again and the spring unlocks, pushing the tip back into the body of the pen. Simple as that. So now that we know how spring locks actually work in real life, let's compare that with how we see them used in the games. The whole point behind these spring lock suits is that they can be worn as mascot costumes or you can set them up on their own and make them animatronics. We never get specific details as to how exactly they work, but from what we do get, I think we can get at least a sense of how the game creator envisions them working. It seems to me like all the supports, motors, and what have you that fill the suit's insides when in animatronic mode can be pulled back and held in place with spring locks, allowing a guy to fit inside. And then when you want to put it back in animatronic mode, you release the spring locks and the springs push all the gears and bits back into place. Is this feasible? With some allowance for BS video game science? Sure. The logic here at least makes sense. A suit like this using spring locks is at least theoretically possible. Is it a good idea? No, no, it's, it's really, really stupid, but we'll get back to that later. Okay, so we know how real spring locks work. We know how they are implied to work in the games. So let's look through the whole franchise and see what events we could chalk up to a spring lock failure. If you want to know the whole story of these games, you should probably go literally anywhere else. But if you already know the story or just don't care, there are really only a few characters that you need to be familiar with today. The first, obviously, are the two spring lock suits. Do they, do they count as characters? Yeah, they got a lot of merch made out of them, so I'll say sure. As far as we know, they were only ever two spring lock suits made, known as Golden Freddy, the bear, and Golden Bonnie, the rabbit. Yeah, they've seen better days. The next guy you need to know about is William Afton, or Purple Guy to his friends. He's the engineer who made all of the animatronics we see in the game, and he's the owner of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, so things were going pretty well for him. Until he decided to become a serial killer, and then things weren't going too great anymore. He's basically the main antagonist of these games, and his whole shtick is that he would wear the Springlock Bonnie suit to lure kids into the back of the pizzeria, kill them, and then hide their bodies in the other animatronics. <laughs> I'm sure no one will ever find them in there. Except, whoops, turns out ghosts are real in this universe because the spirits of those kids go on to possess the animatronics they were stuffed in, which basically sets into motion the events of the Hull franchise. And the last kid you need to know about is, oh, uh, uh, Richard, I know you've been playing a lot of Snap, so maybe you, for, I don't think you included the name of this kid in the notes. Oh, oh, what? He doesn't have a name? One of the main characters in this story introduced eight years ago doesn't have a name yet? Yeah, okay, that's fine. Anyway, this kid right here is the son of William Afton. He doesn't have a name, so people just call him the crying child. And that's, I mean, that's basically all we know about him. He's probably the son of this dude, and he cries. Both of these are potential candidates for the victim of the spring lock failure, but let's take a closer look and see if they still hold up, starting with William Afton. In the third game of the franchise, where these spring lock suits are first introduced, the main guy trying to kill you is Springtrap, or Evil Springlock Bonnie. The real important part for us today is the secret ending of the game, told in glorious 8-bit style. In it, we see Purple Guy, who, remember, is William, get chased into a room in the back of the pizzeria by the ghost of all those murders that he did. Trapped and with nowhere to go, he jumps into the golden Bonnie suit to do something. But uh oh, it's irony. The suit malfunctions and Afton manages to kill himself and stuff himself into one of his own suits. Hooray! Except then he can possess the suit himself as Springtrap and now he's trying to kill us. Ah, shucks. 
Because this is from the same game where we first hear that spring locks can fail in a dangerous way, most people assume that it was a spring lock failure that killed Afton. And you know what? Yeah, I buy it. If the suit really does work in the way that I described earlier, then if the spring locks ever failed and prematurely released the mechanisms they were holding while someone was inside, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what would happen. Could this have been easily avoided? Yeah, actually, yeah, if William Afton really did make all these robots, then he is crap at his job. Like, honestly, he is, he is really, really dumb. Hey, you know what? Kind of reminds me of you, Richard. Are you playing Snap again? You see, in engineering, we have this thing called an FMEA, or Failure Modes and Effects Analysis. What it means is you basically look at all the ways whatever you're making could fail or break and figure out what would happen if it did break. We do this because we want to make sure that if our mechanism does fail, it will fail safely. So just as a hypothetical example, you might want to ask yourself what might happen if the spring locks failed while a guy was inside. And if that answer is the guy would be impaled by sharp machinery from every angle and die, I mean, that's not a great sign. So let's do a little design review for Mr. Afton because <laughs> I have some notes. First of all, while the use of spring locks isn't in and of itself a terrible idea here, he's using the totally wrong type of spring. You see, in theory, if you take any spring and compress it or stretch it by a given amount, it will always return back to its original state. However, in reality, if you deform a spring too much, you can permanently damage it. For that reason, there are actually two types of springs. Compression springs are designed to be compressed, while tension springs are designed to be pulled. It's pretty clear from, well, well this, that these spring lock suits use compression spring locks. You pull the parts back, compress the springs, and then when the spring locks release, it pushes everything back into place. What he should have done was use tension springs, have the natural resting place of all the parts be out of the way, and then when you want to turn it into an animatronic, you pull all the parts towards the center and lock them in place. Then, when you want to turn it back into a suit, you would release the spring locks and everything is pulled out of the way. That way, if the spring locks ever did fail, it wouldn't be when there's a guy right where the springs are trying to go. Not only is this a much safer option, it's also just a more mechanically sound one. If you have a bunch of parts held in place by nothing but springs, then those parts are going to vibrate like crazy, things are going to move out of place, and your suit is going to break pretty quickly. When your parts and motors and stuff are operational, you want them to be locked soundly in place. But the best solution, both from a safety and a cost perspective? Just don't. Don't have a robot that you can wear as a costume. Making something like this actually functional in real life would be so complicated. So many things could break and go wrong. I guarantee you it would be faster, easier, and crucially for a mad scientist that probably doesn't care about safety too much, less expensive to just have two suits. One that's always an animatronic and one that's always just a cloth mascot costume. Sometimes in engineering, you gotta stop asking yourself if you can and start asking yourself if you should. Also, side note, if you're gonna make a mascot to try and appeal to kids, don't give it creepy teeth. I mean, who's, who's that helping? But back to our question of whether or not this is the spring lock failure that we've been hearing about, assuming that William is indeed terrible at his job, which, seems pretty likely at this point, I do buy that this scene is depicting a spring lock failure and, I don't know, finding the CEO of the company dead in one of his own costumes would probably be grounds to decommission the spring lock suits. So I'm gonna say this one is definitely possible. So let's take a gander at the second instance and see how it compares to the first. Also, fair warning, this one revolves around a child getting killed instead of a serial killer, so if you don't want to hear about all that, just skip to this timestamp. 
So, one game later in Five Nights at Freddy's 4, we are introduced to this kid, Crying Child. He's crying because he is terrified of the animatronics at Freddy's and honestly, fair enough. Despite that debilitating fear, his family decides that the local Freddy's was the perfect place to hold his birthday party. The kid hides under the table crying when his older brother and his gaggle of friends pick him up and, to tease him I guess, shove his head into the Golden Freddy animatronic's mouth while it's performing. And based on the fact that this is literally a game franchise about dead kids, I think you can guess what happens next. Told you it was bad. The jaw of the Golden Freddy clamps down on the kid's head, which eventually leads to his death and the possession of the Golden Freddy suit. Now, because we know that all of the golden animatronics are Springlock suits, most people attribute this to another Springlock failure. However, just because they're called Springlock suits, that doesn't mean that the whole thing is made of Springlocks. So the question here is, would it make sense for there to be a spring lock in the jaw mechanism? And the answer, based on what we know about how actual spring locks work, is a resounding no. Let's break it down. Unfortunately, it's not super clear how exactly the jaw mechanism here is supposed to work. When you get jump scared by the Golden Freddy suit in various games, it appears to have a hinged jaw. But when we see it in the 8-bit minigame, it looks like it has two pneumatic pistons that push the top of the head up and down. It's not super clear which design is supposed to be the true canon one, but it actually doesn't matter because neither of them should involve any springs, let alone spring locks. Think about it. In the cylinders design from the 8-bit minigame, if you have a pneumatic cylinder that pushes at the top of the head up, why would you need a spring to pull it back down? You can just release the pressure in the cylinders and let gravity take care of it. If there were springs involved anywhere, they would presumably be used to hold the top of the head up. You'd compress the springs to close the mouth, and then when you release the pressure, the mouth would pop back open. Same goes for the hinge design. There's really no reason to have springs involved here. There's so many simpler ways to do it. I suppose if you were determined to make the jaw spring loaded, you could have tension springs that you would stretch out to open the mouth. I guess you could include spring locks if you wanted the mouth to permanently stay open. And then if you release the locks, the jaw would be pulled shut. But the bottom jaw is not a big piece. It's probably just some sheet metal covered in cloth, maybe a support beam in the back. So it's not like it would be super heavy. So the springs you would need to pull it back up don't need to be that strong. Certainly not strong enough to break through bone. Not only is using a spring this strong just overkill, it's also bad from a design perspective. If the jaw clamps shut with this much force, then it means you need to exert more than that amount of force just to get it open, meaning you need to buy a more powerful motor, meaning you need more energy, it's just bad all around. What he should have done here was bust out the old free body diagram and find the weakest a spring could possibly be that would still be strong enough to pull the jaw up and closed. But even if we did assume that it was a hinged base mechanism and Afton was determined to drop a ton of money on way too strong springs, we know for a fact that there is no spring lock mechanism at play here. Take a closer look at this cutscene. I'm sure most of us were focused on the kid, but take a closer look at Freddy. See its mouth? It's clearly moving up and down on a set cycle to make it look like it's singing or whatever. This implies to me that either there is a motor attached directly to the jaw that turns a bit clockwise to open and then back counterclockwise to close, or some type of cam or linkage system in there where you have a motor spinning at a constant speed that makes the mouth repeatedly open and close on a loop. And if you have a system like this, well, first of all, you probably don't have any springs, but even if you did for some reason, you definitely wouldn't have a spring lock because if you locked a tension spring open while the motor was running, you just break something. So does this scene here depict a kid dying at the hands of a spring lock suit? Yes, but was it the result of a spring lock failure? In my professional opinion, no. 
While it may make some sense to utilize a spring lock to hold things out of the way while you wear a suit, there is no good reason to utilize a spring lock in the moving jaw mechanism. In fact, it seems like this death was not caused by a failure at all. By all accounts, the suit was operating exactly as it was intended to, moving the jaw open and close repeatedly to mimic singing. It's just a shame that, when selecting a motor, William didn't anticipate what would happen if something or someone got in the way of the moving jaw. But you know what, that's kind of exactly on brand for him at this point. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. William Afton is just like my assistant Richard. They are both terrible at their jobs. Hang on, you're not like secretly a, a villain or anything, are you? Are you? So, is this definitive proof that the death of William Afton was the event that caused these springlock suits to be decommissioned and that it couldn't possibly have been the death of the crying child? I mean, probably not, considering the fact that the guy who made this game was, well, is a game designer and not a mechanical engineer. I'm assuming he didn't do an extensive analysis of the feasibility of spring locks in a suit animatronic hybrid, nor should he have. I mean, it's a, it's a video game about ghosts and pizza. It's entirely possible that this is supposed to be a spring lock failure in the eyes of the story, but I mean, come on. You know how often I get to put my real engineering degree to use on this channel and not just some statistics class that I took one time? It's practically never. And I mean, look, I'll be real. I just want an excuse to buy a cool new fidget toy. You can just pull, I honestly, I, when I bought it, I thought it would be a lot smaller and a lot easier to play with, but you really gotta, yeah, really crank that thing back, whew. Or, I don't know, maybe I'm just weak and out of shape, so that's, uh, that's kind of embarrassing. Richard, you'll cut this part out, right? Richard? Richard, are you playing Snap again?